Are there? All right. So we're going to start with a problem. My closed loop is this path right here. And like we said yesterday, does it matter where I start? No, but on the path on the right, I'm definitely going from origin to 2, 4. And the path on the left, I'm going from 2, 4 to the origin. So it doesn't matter where I start, but you have to take into consideration that one of the paths is essentially going backward. Okay? They both can't be going upward. That, that wouldn't really work. So there's nothing about this problem that's terribly taxing. Okay, this, I've made the numbers kind of friendly. So let's call this C1 and let's call this C2. That means the answer to this question is simply, I'll write it kind of this way, C1 MDX NDY plus C2. This is the answer to this question. I take the sum of the individual line integrals. Everybody cool with that? Okay, so we do this as literally two different problems. So let's start with the first one. On C1, what parameterization would you like to use? Again, I, I wrote y as a function of x. That makes it a little bit easier, right? So we'll say let x equal t, let y equal t squared, and t will range from what to what? Zero to zero. Which is it? If x is t, then I look at the x coordinates. So zero to two. If y were t, then it would be zero to four. Okay? So the integral that I want to do will be the integral from zero to two. Now, x is t. I'm just going to write right over the top row. This will be my scratch work. So x is t, y is t squared. Oh, we forgot one thing. What did we forget? Dx is one dt. Dy is two t dt. That's kind of important. Okay, so this would be 6t squared plus 4t times 2t, all times 1 dt. This would be 8t squared minus 2t quantity cubed, all times 2t. Very important that I, that I take my time and get this part right. If I miss one piece, the whole thing's going to fall apart. Um, why Wouldn't it be... Did I yeah, wouldn't it be t squared instead of 2t? Which one are we looking at? On the left one, the dx. It should be 4t times t squared. Well, if x t. is t. Put y is on the right. The y. Oh, I said 2. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I was looking at this one. Thank you. That should be t squared, shouldn't it? Like I said, if we make one Thank small you. error. Did I do the same thing on both sides? Yes. I did, didn't I? Yep. See, that, that's going to be the next problem. The next problem will be two. I'm just working ahead. <laughs> Good catch, guys. Yeah, yeah. That would that would not have worked out particularly well. Let's see. Let's make sure that's right. T T squared. I said T squared, but I, unfortunately I was looking at this one. And then that. All right. So what do we got here? We have T cubed. We have a T squared. No, we have a T cubed there. So this piece here will be what? 16 T cubed. That's T to the sixth. So minus two T to the seventh. Does that look right to you? So I can combine some things, can't I? I always prefer doing all my scratch work off the side. So when I write my integral, the next thing I can do is integrate it. I don't like writing the integral and then doing like three steps of simplification while it's still an integral. It feels like I'm not going anywhere. So what do we got as an integrand? We have 6t squared, 4t cubed, 16t cubed. So that's plus 20t cubed. And looks like 2t to the 7th. Everybody okay with that? This is the first piece. Okay? Did I, did I lose? Oh, minus. Thank you. Oh. I need more coffee. Clearly. Yeah, let's get that. Does that look right? 
We don't proceed until we agree. Okay. Well, this is a pretty simple antiderivative. Okay. So I'm going to get 2t cubed plus 5t to the fourth minus 1 fourth t to the eighth. I was doing a count two lecture yesterday, and as I'm racing through, one of the students asked the right question and said, I understand everything we're doing because I make mistakes on my antiderivatives on a regular basis. Is there a check? Yeah. If you're in my Calc 1, I tell you to check now. <laughs> differentiate 6t squared, okay. Differentiate 20t to the third, okay. Differentiate, okay. I check right then and there. Absolutely 100% of the time, no matter how simple the problem is, I check it right then. I don't want to wait till the end of the problem to find out I have a wrong answer. <laughs> and the error occurred really early on. We all, we're all guilty of that one, but we want to avoid that one. And this is going from 0 to 2. So if you have calculators, what's our answer here? 160. 160? Thank you. Well, you're already ahead of us here. Great. So he says 160, quick check. So I have 16 plus 80, that's 96. Minus. Never mind. Hmm. I don't, oh, I, oh, you added yeah. minus 64, so what should that be? 32. 32. We think alike, Samuel. It's our name. We're very positive people. We hate subtracting, right? Some of you are like that, right? You just you hate subtracting. Right? You want everything to be positive. Okay, 32. Does that number mean anything to us? No, it's just it's the work done on the first path. That's it. You know, don't, don't read anything into that. But now we're going to do the second path. And now the parameterization, I'll get it right this time. Y is going to be 2t. Dx is going to be 1 dt. And dy is going to be 2 dt. And t will range from, once again, 0 to 2 because it's a closed loop. Oh, can you guys hold one second? Can you pause that for one second? Hardly ever get that call, by the way. It's not even once a week anymore. Okay. So, let's do this one. What's different about this setup? Goes from 2 to 0. Good. It goes from 2 to 0. If, if I don't get anything else right, I want to get that piece right. Okay. Now, let's go back and plug in. So, x is t. Y is 2t this time. So 6t squared plus 4t times 2t times 1 dt. 8t squared minus 2t cubed, and this time times 2. OK, we did that right. I've got a 6t squared and a 16t squared. Is that right? Tell me that. Is that right? Oh, 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 sorry. There's one here too. So that's a 14 t squared. There we go. 14 t squared and a 16 t squared. So what are we? 30 t squared. That's why we do it separately, just to make sure. Now, how about the t cubed? So I've got a minus 8 t cubed, so minus 16 t cubed. And if you see an error, please point it out. Nothing worse than doing a problem incorrectly when you saw the mistake early on. So, double check. So I have 14 of them, 16 of them. Okay. All right. I feel good about that. So this will be 10t cubed minus 4t to the fourth from 2 to 0. So if you want to just go like that. So that's going to be 80 minus 64. So what's my answer? Negative 16. Negative 16. Therefore, the answer to this question is 32 plus, if you will, negative 16. So it's 16. Okay? I want to keep that in the back of my mind because we're going to come back to this problem after we develop some stuff. Okay? I, I, I I'll rewrite it, I'll restate it, but we won't redo it this way. Okay, we all understand this. There's nothing about this process that is terribly taxing. It's just well, long. Was any step hard? No, no, it's, it's algebra, really. It's, there's not a whole lot going on here. 
But it was busy. Now, one of the things I will tell you, I made a closed loop by two paths. That's the smallest closed loop there can possibly be is two paths. If you have a circle, you still have a top half, bottom half, or right half, left half, because you have to have functions. Most paths are going to be more than two, aren't they? Heck, I could just do something as simple as a rectangular path. That's easy, but it's still four separate paths. We did one the other day with just a few different line segments. So two is the minimum number you can possibly have. Most paths are going to be bigger than this, but it's the closed path that I'm interested in. So now what we're going to do is we're going to develop something called Green's Theorem that will look at this problem from a different point of view. Okay? So if we could go ahead and if you guys could shift a bit. And if you wouldn't mind, I need to go. I'm going to go to the other board to start it because I'm going to need the space. I need to put on my picture. Okay. Oh, you don't need to take all your stuff. Just all right. I need you to not, not block the camera. That's all. <laughs> okay, this is, this is perfect. Okay. So. Seems a little far away. All right, I have a closed loop. It's not any particular shape. It's just some nebulous shape, okay? Oh, man, that looks really like a rotated eclipse. That can be anything you want to do. I have some strange nebulous shape, and what I want to do, this is the problem. I want to do MDX plus MDY. Now, I showed you guys before, you can actually look at this problem as two separate problems. We can treat this problem as this. Everybody understand that? That's, by the way, that's not efficient. If I did that this way, do you all agree that that would have taken me so much longer if I did that as two completely separate problems? It would have been double the work. So in other words, for that problem, there would be no advantage, but it is still correct. And the reason I'm going to split it up is I'm going to do this problem first till its completion, get a result. Then I'm going to do this problem till its completion, get a result, and then add the results, and that's going to be our final result. But it's going to be from a different point of view. So going to this picture, we're going to do this one first. So I want you to think of this as I'm going to integrate with respect to x. That absolutely means my boundaries have to be functions of x. They cannot be functions of y. So where are the functions of x? Well. When is it no longer a function? The moment I get the vertical thing. So let's go from, I'm going to visually go from about there to about there. Basically, I'm going from vertical tangent to vertical tangent. So to make it easier, get my numbering right, let's call this, we're going this way, remember? So let's call this y equals f1 of x. And let's call this one y equals f2 of x. And does it matter which one we call c1 and c2? No, maybe I call that one c1, maybe I call that one c2. Okay. So what I want to do is set up the problem this way. Again, I have to go from vertical tangent to vertical tangent because from here to here, that's definitely a function. That's a different function. If this had been a circle, right, we would have gone probably top half, bottom half. That makes it really easy to conceptualize. Again, I just have some generic nebulous shape here. So my m dx, what is m? m is a function of x, y. So the first thing I'm going to do is, let me rewrite this as this. Everybody got that? The closed loop has to be the sum of the individual guys. So let's just look on C1 for a moment. So on C1, okay, oh, I, I did leave off, sorry, I left off one thing. Let's call that A to B. I do, I do need values there. So C1, I'm starting B, I'm going to A. So what will this one be? That will be from B to A of what? M of X comma F1 of X. Make sense? My y is very specifically f1 of x. What I now have is an integral that only has one variable. 
We're not going to parameterize in this case. We're going to just go ahead and re relabel it like this. That's legal. You can always do that. And then the second one's going to be from A to B of M of X comma what? I have two of X. Okay, everybody okay with that? Now, I didn't give a specific F1 or F2. That's not the point. I want to rewrite this. I'd like to rewrite this as one integral. Does everybody agree that one integral I could do except for one small problem? I can't write it as one integral yet. How come? Very specifically, it does the, the limits. The limits don't match. Now, would you rather write it as B to A or A to B? Which feels more comfortable to you? A to B, because that's, that's increasing from left to right. So in order to do that, what do I have to change this one to? Negative. Negative A to B. Ah, well, that wasn't hard. That's a comma. Sorry. Okay, everybody cool with that? Can I now add these integrals together? Yep. But you know what, my m's are not the same because my input here is a different y value than my input here. So as I move up to here, as one integral, this is the integral from a to b of this minus this, obviously. So it would be m of x, f2x minus m x, f1x, dx. OK? Is that nice and pretty? Great. Now, everything I've said is true, everything I've said is correct, but there's still something you don't love about this integral. I'm doing f2 minus f1. That doesn't feel natural, does it? When you're defining the area in an integral, you always do top curve minus bottom curve, don't you? I'm doing bottom curve minus top curve. That's backwards, like going from b to a is backwards. I would really rather this be top curve minus bottom curve so it looks like a, a typical integral. How could I possibly switch the order of subtraction? Limits. Not the limits, simpler than that. Just simply factor out the negative side. Ah, piece of cake. So how about if I wrote this as negative a to b, m of x, f1 of x, minus m of x, f2 of x. Okay, now I've got top curve minus bottom curve I'm integrating. Now, top curve minus bottom curve I'm integrating. Doesn't that kind of feel like I'm finding area? Think about this for a moment. I just said the top curve minus the bottom curve in a sense. Doesn't, that, doesn't this kind of feel like area? Yeah, so here's what I'm gonna ask you. If I had evaluated a double integral, I'd integrated the double integral I got to here, and then I plugged in these values right here. What would it have looked like? So I'm going backwards from integration. If I plugged in these limits to here and here, wouldn't that have meant this had to look like m of x comma y? And then I evaluated it here minus evaluating here. Now stare at that for a moment. Don't go this way. Go this way. Does that work? Stare at that for a moment. Does that work if I evaluated those endpoints? It, it should, yeah. Is f1 of x and f2 of x a function or evaluated already? No, that's the, the upper and lower y values. Do you remember when I first introduced double integration, I said, let's take a calc 1 integral, you know, from a to b, um, top curve minus bottom curve, and then I said, let's work backwards and see if we can write that as a double integral. It's not efficient to write it as a double integral, but we did. So in order to do that, we had to make a double integral where I was evaluating the y values as my limits of integration. Okay. Now let's go back one more step. What is the double integral that would have produced this? Well, I'll make it easy. That has to be f2 of x, doesn't it? And that has to be f1 of x. But what has to go here 
what did I integrate to get m? And by the way, what would I have integrated it with respect to? What variable? Y d. Yeah, because I, I still have the x to go. I have the y dx. What goes here? What do you have to integrate to get m? You have to integrate a derivative. You have to integrate the derivative of m with respect to y. So this would have to be partial of m with respect to y. Does that make sense? Now again, I want you to go backwards. You walk in the room, you see the statement right here. You go, oh, I'm integrating the m ui with respect to y. That gives me m from here to here. Now when I evaluate it, I get this. OK? We're almost done. Look at my thing. Isn't that my region in the xy plane? Let me just call that generically. And isn't this technically da? I'm integrating over the region in the xy plane. I mean, look at my picture. That's kind of obvious. And that's da. So I'm going to write this one more way, just to be very generic. And the reason I'm writing it that way, because we know it really doesn't matter the order. I'm integrating over the region in the xy plane, da, but my integrand turns out to be this. And that negative sign turns out to be very important, by the way, too. So we have just figured out this piece. That piece right there, I'll put it above it, is the double integral over the region of the partial of m with respect to y of the a. OK? Now we're going to do the same thing to this guy. And now I'm going to use that board. So if you would go ahead, <laughs> we can go ahead and turn that. Hopefully everybody doesn't get dizzy watching this. All right, you all remember this answer, so I'm going to move on from this. So we're going to do this for the, for the other part, and a lot of the algebra I do is going to feel similar. Not identical, but similar. All right, so let me get rid of all of this. Is this a good one? All right. Now, now we're going to attack this. So, to the best of my ability, pretend I'm throwing the exact same picture. Okay? But now I want to do this integral. What's different? Well, I'm integrating with respect to y is the main difference, so I cannot use the same boundaries as I did there. We know this from Calc 1 because I've re re reiterated it. <laughs> Try saying that fast three times. We know that every area problem you've ever set up in Calc 1 can be integrated with respect to x or y. Just one of them usually presents itself as much easier than the other. So if my boundaries are all y as a function of x, you integrate with respect to x, no brainer. But if your boundaries are all x as a function of y, then you integrate with respect to y. Sometimes it's the same level of difficulty. Sometimes one's way harder than the other. But you can always go both ways. I have a closed loop. I have to split it in half. Right? Some, some I'd have to split into more than two pieces. But I want to do this with respect to y, which no longer means I want top and bottom. What do I want now? Left and right. I want left and right. Good. So now I'm looking for the horizontal tangents. There's one, say, about right there. OK, so now I have a left curve and a right curve. So let's call, let's say, uh, how about C3, C4? Let's call this one, so what did I call it? I called it the top one. So let's call this one x equals g1 of y. And let's call this one x equals g2 of y. You've all done this. When you had y equal x squared, you might have said, oh, let's do x equals square root of y instead. You can always go back and forth. Sometimes it's harder, but you can always go back and forth. So I've renamed my boundaries. And now my limits of integration, let's say that's from uh, d, d to e. I'm not going to use C because I'm already using C for, <laughs> for my curves. 
So now what does this become? This becomes the integral C3 plus the integral C4. Okay. Now let's perform the same magic we just did. It should feel very similar. The result will look different, but similar because the process is going to be similar. Now, n is a function of x and y. But I'm moving along these curves, so I'm going to be replacing x with functions this time in the same way that I replace y with functions over there. So what's the first one going to be? On C3, this is the one that's going to feel like I'm going backwards, isn't it? So I'm going from what to what? E to D. I'm going from E to D of N of, now X in this case is G2 of Y, comma Y dy. Okay, that's it. I don't have to be clever. If I had specifically named those functions, then you would be putting those in there. It's not a big deal. Plus D to E of n of g1 of y, comma y, dy. Isn't there a reason you picked to do g2 first? No, I could have done g1. Wouldn't matter. I, I just my brain. I'm moving left to right. Would it have mattered? Because I'm adding them. Would it? Would it have mattered? No. But you also recognize I probably want to rewrite the first one, don't I? Because once again, the limits are backwards. And most of us would agree, no, I want my limits going from D to E, because that's going forwards. Just like on the previous problem, you said from A to B, that's going forwards. And if this is going to end up looking like area, I kind of like my limits to make sense. So let's rewrite this piece. And the reason we're doing this is so we can put this together as one integral now. Just like we did previously, now we're going to have one integral integrated with respect to y. Obviously, I'm subtracting here. So this will be d to e of n of g1 of y comma y minus n of g2 of y comma y dy. Now, in the previous problem, when we got to this point in the problem, we went lower curve minus higher curve, and that, did, that felt backwards, and it was backwards, actually. But what am I doing now? Aren't I taking right curve minus left curve? And that is the right order, isn't it? So I don't, I, I don't need to do anything to this guy. He's fine. Right? I can leave this one alone from this point on, because I am subtracting in an order that I would if I was creating an area problem. So now, like we did before, this looks like it was the result of an integration where I evaluated it. So let's rewrite this as d to e of n of xy evaluated g2 of y on the bottom, g1 of y on the top, all integrated with respect to y. You see, I'm putting these into the x-coordinate and then subtracting in this order. That would put me right here. We know this because we know how to do double integrals now. So now let's go backwards one more step. Where would this have come from? Well, pretty sure those guys would become the limits, wouldn't they? And that's a dy on the outside, which means I had to have integrated with respect to x. What did I integrate with respect to x to get me to capital N? There's only one thing that I can do. Partial of, Partial of n with respect to x. Beautiful. And double check. This is the derivative of n with respect to x. When integrated with respect to x, produces n. And then I would evaluate that at the endpoint. Now, like we did before. See this stuff right here? Isn't that the region in the xy plane? Y is going from here to here, X is going from here to here. That's clearly RXY. And isn't this still DA, just like before? So as a summary, what I have essentially done is just come up with, this is the double integral over the region in the XY plane of the partial of N with respect to X, DA. Hmm, okay. Okay, so what's the big deal? Well, let's summarize, shall we?
we figured out what this guy was. That was the double integral over the region of the xy, or the negative, I should say, of the double integral of the partial of m with respect to y dy. And the second one was the double integral over the region in the xy plane of the partial of m with respect to x dA. Sorry, dA, not dy, sorry. Well, can I squeeze these together? Because they have the same region in the xy plane, they're both dA's. And aside from perhaps the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is considered the most important thing in calculus. This is called Green's theorem. Green's theorem says if you're doing a work problem, which that's what this is, over a closed loop, we're in two dimensions, mind you, you'll get the same answers if you do the double integral over this. So right off the bat, you're saying, wait a minute, how can I take a single integral problem, change it to a double integral, and say that's going to make my life easier? I went through all the problems that exist last night. There, there are infinitely many. And it was easier every time, by the way. I, it took me a while. I, I, was, you know, I was up really late. Um, no, this is always infinitely easier. Why? Because these are derivatives. In other words, this thing here, in every problem that exists, will be simpler than this thing here. But I've got to do a double integral. Yeah, it's not a complicated double integral, but it is a double integral. Green's theorem says that the single integral of the closed loop that produces work is equal to the double integral over the region of this quantity. <coughs> oh, by the way, how do we measure whether something's conservative in two dimensions? Didn't the partial of m with respect to y have to equal the partial of m with respect to x? So if something's conservative in two dimensions, then the partial of m with respect to y has to equal the partial of m with respect to x, which means my integral would be zero. And there's the mathematical proof why a closed loop on a conservative force always gives you an answer of zero, because you're integrating zero. That's the absolute, and that's the only proof that exists. See, I can't prove that you're always going to get zero in a closed loop. You can do examples all day long. I said you're going to get zero, but that's not a proof. And I know you believe me, you know, unless we were talking like Bitcoin or something. I was completely wrong. Okay. But that's the mathematical proof that if you have a conservative function or a conservative vector over a closed loop, because in a conservative vector, this is zero, isn't it? Ah, that's the proof why we love conservative. But the vast majority of problems are not conservative forces. So in other words, this is not going to be zero the vast majority of the time, but it's still going to be simpler. So now I want to go back to the problem we started class with. Okay. And then I want to do it using Green's theorem because we already know the answer. And we agree that problem was not long-winded. It wasn't difficult. I chose very, very friendly stuff. You know? There's nothing about that problem with the terrible tax. So I did the closed loop. I wrote it down. So. like to now employ Green's theorem as a way of solving this problem. So the first thing you always do, and this is critical, identify your M and your N. Sometimes, believe it or not, sometimes people get it backwards. And there's a second thing that is a common mistake that a lot of folks don't realize is, would there be anything wrong with me subtracting here? Would there be anything wrong with that? No, but you've got to be mindful. If there's a negative sign here, that does change your second partial, doesn't it? So you always have to be aware of, am I adding, am I subtracting my quantities? So in this case here, what is my? What is my? 4x. What is nx? Nx is 
16x. So nx minus my is 16x minus 4x or 12x. Okay? This is Green's theorem. This is equal to the double integral over the region in the xy plane of 12x dA. This is Green's theorem. Now, this was not bad because I gave you very, very friendly functions. Do we agree? But it was still a lot of work. So you did a lot of stuff there. Now you're going to work with that. Right off the bat, you want you know, <laughs> that doesn't look quite so bad. Now, do you want to go dy dx? Do you want to go dx dy? Or does it make any difference whatsoever? First of all, it doesn't make any difference. No. But how did I define my boundaries? Didn't I define both of them as y as a function of x? So most of us would go, you know what, let's go dy dx, right? Delta x rectangles, because then I don't have to rewrite either one of them. Would there be anything wrong with dx dy? No, but then I've got to rewrite both of them. So most people, when given the choice, go, no, 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 give me vertical rectangles. If it doesn't make any difference, it's kind of like when we're talking volume problems and it doesn't matter whether you use that plane, that plane, or that plane as your floor, we always choose that plane, don't we? Because conceptually, it's easier for me to think vertical, even though we know it doesn't matter mathematically. So most of us would say, you know what, let me go this way. OK. So therefore, I'm going to go dy dx. <clears throat> so x is going to range from what to what? 0 to 2. And y is going to range from x squared to 2x. Good. Never do one of these without drawing the picture. I drew the picture, you didn't have a choice. But when you're told the problem, there's no picture, you're just told, here's the boundaries. When we don't draw a picture, what are we most likely to do? What about half of all answers I get from a Calc 3 student will have these guys flip. Because x squared is always bigger than 2x. No, not from 0 to 2, it isn't. <laughs> no, just so you know, on, on every quiz, on every exam. The limits tend to be flipped. And it's usually because we didn't draw a picture. We tried to do something in our head that didn't work. So obviously, draw the picture. Just make sure you're right. Now, I'm integrating with respect to y. So what's my antiderivative? 12xy from x squared to 2x dx. I'm going to pour easier to see. And that will be, let's see, when y is 2x, I have 24x squared. When y is x squared, I have 12x cubed. Does that look right? 24x squared, 12x cubed. I think that's right. OK, Will says I'm good. All right, I believe him. So that would be 8x cubed minus 3x to the fourth from 0 to 2, which would be 64 minus 48 or 16. That's what we got the first time. Now, it should be kind of an oh, duh, as to which way was easier. <laughs> That's why. This is always going to be easier. There's no exception. This, it's always going to be easier. I gave you friendly stuff. I could give you ugly stuff. Ooh. You see, if, you give, if I give you ugly stuff, then you're bound by working through the ugly stuff. But what often happens is when I do these guys here, what I'm ending up with is usually a lot simpler than what I started with. Okay? Let's, let's do another one. Um, I love Green's theorem because it gets me off the hook to have to parameterize something that's really, really not so friendly. All right?
Your closed loop is the hemisphere. And I actually have to tell you this. It's not just that. It's also that. Right? You've got to come back and complete the loop. If I only went from here to here, that's a line integral that begins here and ends here. Does everybody understand that? That's not a closed loop. It's not a closed loop unless I finish the loop. I want to evaluate this over this. Okay? So, you walk into class right now, you kind of miss the first, you know, 45 minutes. So what are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, no, no problem. I'm going to call x 6 cos t. I'm going to call y 6 sin t. Do we all agree with that? So then this is going to become a bunch of x's, and then I'm going to have tangent of 6 cos t. I'm not really sure what to do with the tangent of 6 cos t. And over here I'm going to have e raised to the sine of 6 cos t. Okay, I can deal with that, except that no matter how hard I try and what parameterization I do, there will be no antiderivative to anything I write. None of these can be integrated. Use the most powerful computer software on planet Earth. They can't be integrated. It can't even be attempted. You're going to have your machine shaking violently, smoke coming out of it, the tilt sign. Yeah, you, you can't integrate the tangent of the sine function or e raised to the sine of. You all understand that's an impossible question. But if I use Green's theorem, hmm, if I use Green's theorem, this is m, this is n, and don't forget that guy right there, too. What is m, y? Negative yeah, squared. What is, oh, I'm sorry, you know what? I'm sorry, that's supposed to be a y. Uh, x, what was I thinking? That's a y, sorry. Can't read my own writing. And what is n, x? Negative y squared. Negative y squared, good. Because I had a negative here. So, what is nx minus my? Or could I write that as negative x squared plus y squared? Is that the same thing? All right. So now we're going to do this. It's the double integral over the region of the xy plane of the negative of x squared plus y squared dA. Well, I'm doing this over a hemisphere. Excuse me, I said a hemisphere. Semicircle, not a hemisphere. What am I? Two dimension. Polar? Are you doing polar because of the integrand? No, you're doing polar because of the region. Do you have to do polar, by the way? No. I could go, I could go y equals the square root, and it may turn out that that's not a difficult integration as a result. I can do that. I don't want to because it might not be an easy integration. It, you know, when I integrate, I may be squaring the square root. Some of you found that in your problems. You're, you're squaring the square root. Everything came out really nice. I would go polar because then I don't have any square roots anywhere. So if I go polar, then this becomes negative r squared. R dr d theta. Yeah, we can't forget that guy. The range of values for r will be what? And lest we forget, that comes from this. If I split this up into a bunch of little sectors, so I'm going from zero to outer piece, which is constant. So that's what? Zero to six, because it's a circle of radius six. And theta limits are? Zero to pi. Zero to pi, because it's only the top half. Good. OK. Would it have mattered what portion of the circle I took? Would it have made any difference in how you do this problem? No. The only difference it would have made is you know, in your theta limits. That's it. Now, let me go ahead and I'm going to erase this over here because I need to finish. Okay. So now that I'm over here, I'm doing the double integral from 0 to pi, 0 to 6, negative r cubed, dr to theta. Okay? I think that's correct. And that's going to be 0 to pi, negative 1 fourth r to the fourth from 0 to 6. And what does that give me? Minus 324. You all agree with that? Negative 324? Yep. And I'm integrating a constant over constant limits of integration. My favorite kind of problem. 
That's it. Now, just to remind you, the only parameterization you could have done is x is 6 cos t and y is 6 sin t. You're, you're dealing with a circle. There's no other parameterization that will work. But when I do that, I not only have to have the dx, which is going to involve a sine and cosine, a dy, a sine, cosine. I'm putting the sines and cosines in for the x and for the y. So now I have something that can't even be integrated, let alone everything else. Yet, this came out really nice because the nastiness was a function, literally, of the other variable. Do you remember when I introduced you to partial derivatives? I asked you some hideous, horrible, beastly thing. I gave you some like gruesome function of x and plus a gruesome function of y and then asked you for a cross partial. A lot of you were clever and said, that's going to be zero. Because <laughs> regardless of how awful it is, when I went to the other variable, there wouldn't be anything left. Sometimes the order you do things makes a huge difference. But Green's theorem, the, the primary thought is I'm taking something, whether I can integrate this or not, by making it a double integral over the region, the reason you would do that is generally, it would be really hard for me to find an exception. Generally, the integrand itself is tiny compared to what you started with. I mean, this versus this. Now, we didn't have to go polar. We chose to go polar. That made it even simpler. Okay, But that's why I did that. Now, it still could turn out that I have nasty functions in here. That's true. I could still have ickiness. Let's say that was a tan y. <gasps> then I've got a tangent showing up here, but it's not a tangent of a, another function, it's just the tangent of y. Oh, okay, then I just gotta integrate that thing. In other words, this, this can still be done. It can still be done. I, I wouldn't want to do that problem, it's kind of difficult. Any questions so far? So the derivation, the derivation as you see is, I'm just using, I don't want to say simple calculus, because that's kind of an oxymoron, right? Simple calculus. But I'm doing stuff you already know, and I'm not giving anything specific, no specific functions. But what we're doing is we're saying, if I had started with a double integral and I started evaluating it, this was the order of things. I went in reverse. And we came up with the double integral that was equal to what we started with. So that was, that was kind of clever, you know. Mr. Green was, was a clever guy, I guess, right? <laughs> because it's like, wow. How, I, I, I don't know how anybody saw that. It's just phenomenal. Question. Um, so it is the kind of the area, right, that we're doing? Well, no, no, we're integrating over the area. So you could, you could think of it one way. This, this looks like a volume integral. You all agree with that? It looks like a volume integral, but it's not. It's still work. How can it be work? Well, what am I doing here? Isn't this a force function dotted with dr dt? So I'm integrating force dr dt, oh, that gives me force times distance. So what is it I'm integrating now? I'm integrating over an area, but it's still got to be work. So think about that. What are area units? Keep it simple. Think force times distance if it helps. So that means that this would technically be force per distance. Because now when I integrate it over area, Right? What's area divided by distance? Distance. So if you want to give it meaning and from a unit's standpoint, this integram would be tepid, basically force per distance, where these guys are force. Does that, does that make sense? Now, don't try to say, okay, where, where does the area fit into my actual force calculation? No, 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 no. You're, you're completely changing the problem. You're doing a form of a transformation, like the Jacobian problems, where they're a form of transformation. And we prove we get the same answer. But the details of what you're doing right in the middle of there, that's not the critical thing. We showed that algebraically we always get the same answer. So if you wanted to give it units. But the, the main thing is, is I wanted to get a work answer on something that's really complicated. So now, I said on day one of class, I've said this a couple times, I have my wheelbarrow full of stuff. Right? Stuff's falling out, torrential downpour, it's leaking, all this stuff. I'm moving around campus. Point A to point B, this is the definition of a line integral. How much work did I get done from point A to point B? What if I finish where I start? Now Green's theorem gives me an alternate way to do that, what might be a nasty calculation. But if I asked people before class started, and I say, what's the work done over that closed loop, what do most people automatically answer without, without knowing better? 
answers. Yeah, most people answer zero because they, they think that's a good answer and it can be zero, but it's probably not zero. Now we know when it is zero. Zero if it's a conservative force. Was this a conservative force? <clears throat> How do you know it's not a conservative force? Because that's not zero. Oh, okay. <laughs> Could I have designed a problem though that I got an answer of zero? Sure. Yeah, in a closed loop, do you know when you're gonna see zero often in a closed loop? We have sines and cosines. Think about that for a moment. When you evaluate either sine or cosine from zero to two pi, you're always gonna get zero, aren't you? Oh, so if I have a problem with sines and cosines, it might not be conservative, but I might get zero because at each end they, they essentially cancel. You guys did a, I'm, I think it was a volume problem. All right, I asked you to integrate something, the first polar integral you did, and you guys got zero, and everyone was like, what did I do wrong? But I said as a volume, it was half was above and half was below the xy plane. You know, I was showing you why zero made sense. If we had taken a smaller interval, we might not have. You didn't integrate zero to get zero. Here's the thing. If the function is conservative, when you set up this problem, your integrand is going to be zero. That's why your answer is zero. If your integrand is not zero, there are still limits of integration out there that will produce an answer of zero. And that's what I started class by mentioning. An answer of zero does not mean conservative. An Conservative means you're going to get an answer of zero. Okay? Any question on that one? Are we cool? All right, let's keep going. I want to do. Where did I put my ring? Oh. I want to do a few more problems just so we can get the hang of it. And they don't have to be nasty problems. Let's do the integral of about, um, This time we're going to go a circle again, and I'm going to give you this problem here. You could try to do this, but again, we'd run into the problem of when you try to parameterize, right? X must be some function of t, y must be some function of t, and then I'd have a cosine and I'd have an e of another function, and that would be, that would be way, way, way too difficult. So I definitely want to use Green's here. That, that's kind of a no-brainer. I have a closed loop. Now, because my closed loop is a circle, Clearly, we're, probably, we're going to go polar. Agreed? But that polar integral might not be as friendly as the last one. It won't be. Okay, but I can still do it. All right? So, first, what is my? It's 4x. What is nx? Negative 3y squared. Negative 3y squared. So nx minus my is negative. I'll write in this order. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll write it that way. Okay? Not exactly what you were hoping for if you're going to go polar. It just means I'm going to have sines and cosines. That's all. That's not that big a deal. <clears throat> is this a conservative force? No. no. Clearly not. Okay? Most of you have gotten really adept at this concept, this notation. You, it, when I first introduced this idea of the you know, region in the xy plane and writing that down, oh, what is it, what is it? I'm not going to waste my time writing the rectangular limits, you know, plus or minus square root. I'm not going to waste my time because I've already decided I'm going polar. A lot, a lot of you at first would, would go through all the process of writing the rectangular limits that you were never going to use. So I said, don't waste your time writing the rectangular limits, but this is a well-stated problem. I'm doing this problem, 
And if I choose to do the rectangular limits, then I still get to choose what order. But I'm looking at my region saying, no, no, I'm gonna go pull it. Okay, that just is gonna be so much simpler to do. So then, this would become the double integral of what? We're going pull. times R, R theta. theta. Okay, and then my limits? Zero to eight. And zero to eight. We all agree with that. This may or may not be easy, I don't know. But sines and cosines don't intimidate, you know. Functions of sines and cosines might intimidate. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna distribute that R and then I'll have negative 4r squared cos theta minus 3r cubed sine squared theta dr d theta. And my first integration being with respect to r. And I will get so negative 4 thirds r cubed cos theta negative three-fourths r to the fourth sine squared theta. Okay, get out your calculators. We want to get this right. So h cubed is 512, so that'd be negative, what? 2,048 thirds cos. Then eight to the fourth would be 4,096, but over that'd be 1,000. Or so that'd be negative 3072 sine squared theta, all right? I'm gonna take a calculator, should I be? Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Mr. Brown just talked about it. When you have sines and cosines on a closed loop, you get a lot of zeros, you do. This isn't gonna be zero though. Why? What do I have to deal with that's less than fun? The sine squared, the uh, yeah, double angle formula things. No, that's not going to be zero. The cosine is going to give me a zero. Because when I integrate, I'm going to get a sine from zero to two pi. I'm going to go ahead and do the integration, but you guys all know that this guy's going to go away. This guy's not going to Because that integral is not as, quite as friendly. So before we continue, we want to apply our double angle formula to make sure we get the right thing. So we know that the sine squared of theta is one half of one minus the cosine of two theta. So I'm going to replace sine squared with this quantity right here. And then we'll go ahead and multiply that out. So I have negative 2,048 thirds cos, half of 3,072, so that would be minus 1,536 plus 3,072 cosine of 2 theta. Is that look right? Actually, I messed up. Say again? Thank you. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> 1536. I didn't cut it in half, did I? And I think that looks okay. All right. Because of that constant in there, I'm not going to get a zero for an answer. But my answer is not going to be complicated. Now we'll go ahead and integrate. The antiderivative of negative cos. Negative sine. Here's what I tell everybody when they're learning this stuff. When you're doing sines and cosines, we all agree that's probably the only function that I regu regularly get the wrong answer because of plus or minus is because you're always thinking integral. I said, no, always think derivative. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. Good, I did it right. <laughs> Remember, when you're doing an antiderivative, it's always, okay, the derivative of this is this. So give me a function whose derivative is this. I always think of it in reverse then I don't have to remember as much, okay? 
minus 1536 theta. And what's the last one? Well, it's definitely going to involve a sine of 2 theta. It's going to be plus or minus. Well, the derivative of sine is positive cosine, so it's plus. Am I multiplying by 2 or by 1 half? 1 half. Derivative would be 2, so the integral would be 1 half. So what does that give us? That's 768. And I'm going from 0 to 2 pi, and I love that because both of the sine terms, therefore, will be 0. In fact, they're going to be 0 at each endpoint, aren't they? So my final answer is... 3,072, actually negative 3,072 pi. Well, we did the, the integral of cosine. We already had a negative in front of, shouldn't it have gone positive? Well, the derivative of sine is cosine. So the derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's why I say, I always think of it in terms of taking the derivative, because sine and cosine are probably the only functions that all of us agree. That, yeah, we regularly mess up the plus or minus. Yeah. So where do we take the direction into account in green here? The it's, the direction is always, you guys remember, I mentioned this the other day. In a closed loop, the direction is always. Counterclockwise. <laughs> 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 counterclockwise. It's, the direction is always counterclockwise. That's the automatic. So I'm in my pictures. Which way do I have it going? If I reverse direction, what does that do to an answer? <laughs> It changes, yeah, changes the sign because if you think of it this way, it makes it easier. I'm going in the direction of increasing angles. Now, I went 0 to 2 pi. Do I have to go 0 to 2 pi? Remember, first of all, we said you didn't have to start here. Just, just to be ornery. See, Zachary, he likes to start here. He can't go 0 to 2 pi because what would that angle be? If he's starting there, what angle is he starting at? Probably. Five. Five. So then where are you finishing? Three pi. Three pi. But Will says, no, no, I've got that figured out. I'm starting at negative pi. Then I'm finishing at positive pi. Will any of these changes affect my final answer? Actually, no, because the trick terms were still going to be zero, and this was still going to be the difference of that, which is going to be two pi no matter where you start and finish. Is that a good thing? Yeah, <laughs> it means everybody in here could have looked at this differently and had different limits of integration for your angle as long as you were completing a whole circle. In other words, anything you wrote would have been fair game as long as the difference between them was 2 pi. Anything, you, you know, just to be, you know, Katarina just won the lottery, so she's going to go from a million pi to a million 2 pi because she's, you know, got a lot of pi's now. Same answer, isn't it? That's a good thing that it can't matter. But it is only one loop. That's the other thing. Oh, if I try to, if I do more than one loop, why would anybody do more than one loop? Well, sometimes your angle might be a two theta or something like that. In other words, you, you could have something where you end up doing too much and you, oh, I, I've got so more. Or we did a problem way back when where the circle wasn't centered at the origin and we completed a loop in pi. So those are, those are minor things, but those are things you have to take into account. What if it's somewhere else? The circle does not have to be centered at the origin. We just choose to because it makes everything else really simple. But if my circle wasn't centered at the origin, I can still do this problem. It's just a little bit tricky. Okay. We good? Yeah, sines and cosines. A note on integration. When, when I first teach integration in Calc 1, people think of integration as I must memorize a bunch of stuff. If you know how to do derivatives, it's not... There are a few that you know involve logarithms and things. There are a few complicated antiderivative formulas. You know, the integral of cosecant. That's our favorite one, right? <laughs> Natural log of the absolute value of cosecant minus cotangent. No, we hate that one. It hardly ever shows up. But when I'm first teaching integration, I'm saying now take the derivative or x squared. Okay, I did it right. I'm saying. I'm not saying what function is the antiderivative of this. I'm saying what function, when I take its derivative, will give me this. That's the way I teach people to think of derivatives. What function, when I take its derivative, will produce this? OK, it's this guy here. I know to do something to the exponent, but I always check it going that way. Otherwise, it feels like I have to learn a whole new set of values. 
And I remind you, because I, I used to teach the elementary ed courses many years ago, and I would teach people, how do you teach math to a child? And there was usually people that weren't that good at math or like math that much on their own, and how do you teach math to kids? Especially if you don't like it yourself. Do you teach them to memorize a whole bunch of information and facts, or, hmm. So, you learned how to add, you didn't have a whole lot of difficulty. Heck, you learned how to multiply, you didn't have a whole lot of difficulty. Then you had to learn how to subtract and divide. You had a whole lot of difficulty because those are artificial operations. They, they're not actually real operations, believe it or not. What do you mean? There are 11 algebraic properties, okay? Closure, commutativity, associativity, identity, and inverse. That applies to addition, that applies to multiplication. The 11th one is the distributive property. None of those properties apply to subtraction. None of those properties apply to division. They're artificial operations. Oh, <laughs> you can, there's a lot of things you cannot do. So then we learn later that, well, subtraction is the same as just adding the opposite sign. If I do that, and division is just the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, then I can apply order of operations. Because a lot of people mess up order of operations when they throw in those because they're not sure where they work. And so the way we learned to subtract and divide was very, very clever, although people didn't stay with it. You see, it's the exact same mentality of derivatives. There's no difference. I'm going to show you. This is how at least we used to teach people. Or actually, I'm sorry. Let me let me say it this way. Um, not a, sorry. Let me. I, I said that badly. Um, no, I'm going to put smaller numbers. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> it makes more sense. What number do I have to add to five to get eight? Well, that's easy. By the way, I'm defining the subtraction for you right here. Because what is the answer? Isn't it 8 minus 5? This is called the missing addend approach. That's called an addend. That's actually a word. This is called the missing addend approach. This is how you all learn to subtract. But you didn't start by subtracting. See, it's very clever, isn't it? I'm writing an addition problem with a missing piece and saying, what goes here? And everybody has an easy time. OK, I need to add 3 to get to 8 not realizing you're teaching your brain to remove three. Now, four times what number equals 20? Let's see, four times five equals 20. I'm teaching you how to divide, because what's the answer? 20 divided by four. That's called the missing, do you know what the word is? Multiplicand, yeah, that again, sounds made up. This is what was taught literally for centuries. And people have changed the way they do this over the years, which is not necessarily a healthy thing, so you have people have a harder time as a result. You learn how to subtract and divide by just simply taking addition and multiplication and tweaking them slightly. So I say you should learn how to integrate by thinking of it as a derivative in reverse and saying what's missing. Then I don't have to relearn all the things. Yes, you have to be able to integrate, but by thinking about it in terms of reverse. So the plus or minuses give us all issues, don't they? All of us question it, but it's like, okay, when I differentiate this, what will I get? My result, I need to get this back. What thing do I differentiate to get this back again? If you think about it in those terms, a lot of times it's easier. With exponents, it's easier, or certainly with plus or minuses and trig terms, it's easier. And a lot of times, it takes away some of the errors we make. And a lot of you, you do think that way, and you can go really fast as a result. That's a really good thing, right? To be able to fly through these things, okay? Let's do another.
before today, what do you think about this problem? We could do this problem. It, it wouldn't be great because I'm moving along vertical and horizontal lines. So from a line integral standpoint, that is the easiest problem. I'm moving along, so for example, the line that passes through here would be the line y equals three. So x would be t, y would be a constant, therefore dx would be one dt, dy would be zero. Everybody got that? We did, we've done this problem. This is the friendliest type of parameterization that exists. That's the good thing. What's the bad thing? I gotta do four integrations. I gotta do four completely different problems from beginning to end. Yeah, some of them might not be as pleasant. I gotta have to differentiate a tan squared at some point. You just make that secant squared minus one and then that's an easy one. Everybody in here could do this problem from beginning to end. But it's not short. But you could all do this from beginning to end and you would probably do it well and you just gotta be patient. But there are four separate parameterizations, four separate integrations. I gotta make sure I don't mess anything up along the way. One of the good things though is on each try, one of these quantities is going to be zero. Because if x is a constant, then dx is zero. If y is a constant, then dy is zero. So that kind of cuts it down. But because it's a closed loop, if I choose Green's theorem, what is my in this case? Three. Three. What's nx? Eight. Eight. So nx minus my is five. So I can say the answer to this question you're integrating over a rectangle. What is the area of that rectangle, by the way? It's 24. four by six, so it's 24. I'm done. You're integrating a constant over two sets of constant limits integration. In other words, you're integrating a constant. Let me pull the constant out for a moment. If I said this, I'll put a one there. Isn't this exactly the area of the region in the xy plane? This is the inefficient way to do area. The day I introduced double integrals to you, I went backwards and said, let's take our calc one single integral of f of x minus g of x. Let's write it as a double integral with an integrand of one. And we have the x limits, the y limits, agreed? So in other words, this always equals the area of the region you're working with. But my region's a rectangle. That area is a constant. If my integrand was not a constant, no, I have to integrate, there's no way around that. But my integrand was a constant and my region was a rectangle. So the answer to this question is the area of my region times the constant. Can you do that? That's what you should do. <laughs> it's just easier. Because if I put the constant limits of integration, you would have said x is going from 3 to 9, y is going from 3 to 7. You would have integrated, got constant, integrated again, got constant. And at the end, you'd say, I just integrated constant limits twice. Can I take advantage of that? Yeah. See? Totally new problem now. Totally unrelated to this. I'm sorry, little, little When you multiply by the constant in that rectangle part, what, which part are you multiplying by? Well, the, the area of my region was 24. Yep. So my answer is just simply, factor. because think of it as factoring the five out. That, okay. This is 24, and you have five times that. Okay. Remember, when you have a constant limits, of, constant limits of integration and constant integrate, that's when you can multiply. If either one of them are variable, you can't. It won't work, ever. <laughs> now, ooh, same problem. I gave you a circle, and my circle's not even centered at the origin. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Anybody got an idea? 185. What's the, what's the area of this rectangle? Or <laughs> the circle? 36 pi? So what's my answer? 185. 185, 5 times 36 pi. How come? 
because the area is still going to have is going to be a constant. You said, but those aren't constant limits of integration. No, they're not. But I'm integrating an area that I already know. Go back to here. This, by the way, this has nothing to do with whether the limits are constant for a moment. This is equal to the area always. For anything you can draw in two dimensions, that integral equals the area. For anything you could draw. Because you're integrating over the area with a one. That's kind of like what we said before. Be like a volume of height one. <laughs> I take the area of the base times one. This is equal to area regardless of your limits of integration. If your integrand is constant, you're just multiplying that constant by the actual area. And my area is the area of a circle. Now, if I did this through regular means of integration, this would be kind of a nasty integral, wouldn't it? And I, you say, well, I'll just change it to polar, except that it's not centered at the origin. Mm. That would be kind of icky. You're right, this one would be kind of icky. But I don't need to, because I have a constant integrand. So sometimes we have a, we have a freebie and we don't even realize. And that would be a freebie. If your integrand is constant, you're multiplying by the area. That's it. Okay. Assuming the area is something you could easily calculate. So you like this one. I could do it the old traditional way, but that would be really long. <laughs> All right, let's do one more. Yeah, okay. Mm. You don't like this region. Why don't you like this region? Sometimes I have to tell you what you like and you don't like. You like this chocolate. Oh, okay. You don't like this region. Are you going to integrate it dy dx or dx dy? Does it make any difference? Not terribly, but why don't you like either one of them? Because you're going to have to have two integrals no matter what you do, don't you? If I go vertical rectangles, I got one here and I, oh, if I go horizontal, no. Oh, this is awful. Yeah, this, in Calc 1, you sometimes had regions where you had to do two integrals because your boundaries changed. If I'm doing vertical, see, so understand that right here, my boundaries change. On the right, I'm going from curve to this line. On the left, I'm going from curve to this line. Oh, then if I go horizontal, I'm going from line to line. Here, I'm going from line to curve. Okay. No matter what, you got two intervals. All right. But we're still going to use Green's theorem. <coughs> so this is going to equal the double integral over the region in the xy plane of. All right. So let's do it. What is my? Negative sine y. Negative sine y. You're sure? Yeah. Okay, well, you're like, um, did I write this correctly? And then what is n? n x, sorry. So now what is? I'm sorry, what is nx minus m1? I just want to set this one up. What does this end up being? I guess it's sine y minus sine y. Negative 
Okay, so negative. Minus this. Isn't it one minus this. Did I go M Y is negative sign. <laughs> okay, do we all agree on this? Yes. yes. Okay. You guys are killing me. Do we all agree on this? Yes. This minus this five. <laughs> You're everything under the sun. Now, this is horrible. I'm not interested in the final answer. What I want to do is, I want to do this. Okay. I want to walk away for a moment. I want to make sure you understand. There's two things you got to set up. It doesn't make any difference. That's, sorry. Looks like SS. Five, sign Y. There's no way around it. You've got to set up two. Okay? And it's not going to be a pleasant integration. I'm, I'm showing you what can... It can still get evil on you. The reason this can get evil on you is you now have to integrate a sine of y and then evaluate it at a rectangular limit, which, which means what? You might get some unpleasant treats. So now, I said you had a choice of going dy dx or dx dy. I'm trying to show you how you make this choice. If I integrate with respect to y first, that's totally okay. If I go vertical rectangles, that's totally okay. And I'm going to show you why you would never do that. <laughs> All right. What would my y limits be here? I'm going from y equals a half x squared to y equals 3x. And then x would be going from 0 to 1. And then to that I would add, now I'm going from here to here. So I'm going from 1 half x squared to what? To 4 minus x. And x is now going from 1 to 2. OK, everybody cool with that? Great. And in both cases, when I do my antiderivative, what am I going to get? The antiderivative of negative sign is positive or negative? Well, the derivative of cos is negative sign, so it's got to be this guy. And I'm going from 1 half x squared to 3x. Uh, uh, do you see a potential problem here? What's the potential problem? Where are those functions going? Inside. Yeah, it's going to be the cosine of those functions, which now means you have something that you're kind of dead in the water. Oh, I don't want to go dy dx, do I? This, you've had problems, you probably haven't a whole lot of these, but you've had problems where you had to choose and go, you know, if I go that way, it's going to be so much nastier. There was an extra credit problem on the last exam. The question I asked could not be integrated. But if you switch the order of integration, remember that one? You got something that actually worked very nice. You got a U sub and all that kind of stuff. This is a perfect example of that. This looked harmless and friendly, but really, since this is a function of y, I really don't want to do that one first. I want to do that one last. So anything will be added as a multiplier. OK? So in order to do that, well, what would I have to do to my limits of integration? I'd have to change them, wouldn't I? So y equals 4 minus x would become x equals 4 minus y. y equals 3x would become x equals a third y. y equals 1 half x squared would be x equals root 2 root y. You know, stuff like that. Does that mean I can't do the problem? No, what it means is then my first integration would be with respect to x, meaning I have an x in front. And now I'm evaluating x at those other limits, which means I now have a product. I don't know if that product is easy or not, but I know I can solve it using what technique? The only one. It won't be sub. Integration by parts. Integration by parts. I, we're not going to do that problem, because I promise you we're not going to do parts in general in this class. That problem comes up. Will that problem come up often? Oh, yes. 
you're in physics, you're in engineering, that problem's gonna be common, that it's just not pretty, it's not clean, but you do always have an avenue, you always have an out. You can set it up in such a way that you could then continue. What I don't wanna do is put these functions in here. So in the situation, sort of a general situation, when your nx minus my is a function of one variable, and it doesn't matter how you do this, you probably want to integrate with respect to the other variable first, most of the time. Unless all your limits are constants, because otherwise you're gonna end up putting your limits of integration into the argument, like you did in this case. Okay, does that, does that make sense to everybody? So that there is not a whole lot of problems out there, but there are problems where you have to choose a strategy because choosing the wrong strategy makes the problem beyond difficult. I have one problem that's just difficult. <laughs> the other is virtually impossible. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there because I think we've gotten everything we need to get done. Um, are there any questions? Okay, this also marks the end of the material that will be on the next exam. The practice test has been up for several days. I would suggest taking a look in the next few days. Now, if you notice by the schedule, the exam is kind of oddly placed. The exam should fall on Monday, shouldn't it? But I put it on Tuesday on purpose, one extra day. But what that also means is tomorrow's lecture, which is not on the exam, that quiz will still be due before the exam. Why are we gonna do such a thing? Because your final exam is two days after the exam. You, you can't afford to procrastinate on anything. But I put the exam on Tuesday just literally to give you one extra day of prep. So that actually means you have six days until the exam, which is actually quite a long time because of the weekend and everything else. Um, there are three lecture materials left. There's tomorrow, Friday, Monday. All of those things are fair game exam questions. All of those have their own quiz. This is by design. That means when you walk into the final exam, every question on the final has already been asked on a quiz, and most all of them have been asked on an exam. The only ones that won't have been are the last three. You say, well, why don't I put all of them? Well, that would mean our last exam would have to almost be the day of the final, you know, to get everything on. <laughs> We're not gonna do that. Uh, so 23 of the 26 lecture materials are on the first three exams, the last three. Now, what that also means, and, and this is a fair question, because I've had that class before, where you have a couple weeks from the last exam until the final, and the final exam ends up being only the material in the last couple weeks. Anybody ever had that class before? Yeah, your final, that's not a final exam. That's just a last test. But if your class is giving that as a heavily weighted final and they're weighting the biggest grade in the class on just the last few days of lecture, that makes no sense. Our final is cumulative. You could literally say every lecture is equal in weight and importance. Just because the last three worked on an exam doesn't now mean they carry way more weight on the final. No, because they're still each one quiz. That's why there's a quiz on each one. So even when you walk into the final, you will have had a chance to test yourself and try problems, okay? So I just want to be mindful of that. Don't blow off the last few classes. So you have double duty. You're preparing for the exam, you're finishing your quizzes, because in your preparation for the exam, you actually are really preparing for the final, aren't you? Okay, you, you, because you can't think of them as unrelated. But things in this class have sort of accumulated. Most of you are probably pretty good at partial derivatives by now. You know, so if you missed some on the last test, you're probably pretty good. The only true area you might need to go back and review is the original vector stuff. You know, how many right now could tell me the normal and tangential components of acceleration without even thinking about it? Yeah, probably not, right? <laughs> so that's why you get, maybe over the weekend go back and do a couple of problems. Just make sure that you're solid because you don't have a whole lot of time, okay? And, and I would love it if everybody finished, you know, with a flurry rather than, you know, <laughs> Okay, we're, we're almost there. We're almost there. All right, let's go ahead and stop. Um. <laughs>